Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science. Coming up this week, I say something quite obvious. Mars is so far away from Earth, Ben says China. China. And I complain about the recent addition to my back garden. 5,200 tonnes of extraterrestrial dust. Starting off the news this week, we're carrying on with our coverage of the Perseverance rover, which will soon be flying the very exciting Ingenuity helicopter, which will mark the first powered flight on another planet. The cover protecting the small craft has already opened up, and NASA actually plans to test it today, although the results of this test will not be available until tomorrow. Naturally, we'll be talking about that next week. There are several challenges that NASA faces when trying to accomplish this feat, of course the fact that it hasn't been done before being one of them. But also, Mars's atmosphere is much, much thinner than the atmosphere on Earth, so the helicopter will have much less air to use to actually lift it off of the ground. In addition, because Mars is so far away from Earth, Ingenuity cannot be directly controlled live, so commands have to be sent remotely for Ingenuity to act on its own. Scary stuff, let's hope they're able to pull it off. It's breaking news! While editing this video, I found out that Ingenuity is stuck. Apparently it needs a software update and they'll announce the new flight date next week. In other news, a new paper published this week in the journal Earth and Planetary Science Letters has looked at the amount of extraterrestrial dust that falls to Earth over a long term period. The lead author has acknowledged that this topic and those surrounding it is still a matter of debate. While the precise amount of extraterrestrial particles that fall to Earth is still relatively uncertain, if the measurements made in this study were to be extrapolated across the planet, then nearly 5,200 tonnes of extraterrestrial dust reaches the surface of Earth every single year. So where does this massive amount of material come from? Well, the study's data suggests that most of the micrometeorites and cosmic spherules originate from Jupiter family comets and a small area of the asteroid belt. Before they actually enter the atmosphere, this amount is actually far higher, at 15,000 tonnes a year. The data that the study worked with is from the micrometeorite collections around the Concordia station in Antarctica. But now over to Ben, who is very excited to show you his new hat. Also in the news of the last week has been a very interesting discovery of a new pterosaur species, Cunpengopterus antipolicatus, which preserves the first example of a pterosaur with an opposable thumb. Not only that, but it's actually the oldest known record of an opposable thumb found so far, and clearly has some fascinating implications for the ecology of this animal. Coming from Jurassic Age rocks in China, K. antipolicatus is classified as a Darwinopteran pterosaur and due to the presence of its opposable thumb, was an animal adapted to an arboreal lifestyle. Even more interestingly though, the paper describing the species found that closely related pterosaurs from the same locality were not arboreal, suggesting that this was an example of niche partitioning, allowing all these animals to coexist as they were suited to different lifestyles. This is therefore a very significant discovery for all sorts of reasons, adding to the known diversity of pterosaurs, as well as illustrating another case of arborealism in the history of vertebrates. And finally is the naming and description of two new taxa of mammalian morphs from the Cretaceous of China. These animals, coming from the famous Jehol biota, are distantly related to each other, with one, named Phosiomanus sinensis, classified as a kind of non-mammalian cynodont, while the other, Juconodon cheni, is a possible true mammal. However, despite this distinct classification, both had convergently evolved features related to a digging mode of life, making these the first scratch-digging animals known from the biota. Additionally, the increased number of presacral vertebrae in both of these animals helps to shed some light on the evolutionary development of this part of the skeleton in mammalian morphs, another significant result of these animals' discovery. Back to Doug in the studio. Thank you, Ben. Just a quick reminder for our patrons that Ben is doing this month's Q&A and play while I edit the last few parts of mine. So if there's any questions you want to ask him directly, he's going to put up a post on the Patreon later on today so you can do it there. That's it from us for this week's 7 Days of Science. I do hope you enjoyed and enjoy the rest of your week. We'll see you next Wednesday.